Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your response. Good evening. <laughs> it's like being back at school. Um, Mrs. Thompson, I, I'm going off, off script already, I apologise. Mrs. Thompson, I always, always, always joke when we, when we go into a pre-prep assembly because uh, one of the lovely things is about dealing with the older children is that they don't talk back. Um, and we'll say, good morning, everybody, and it'll be stony silence. And then we stay on a Tuesday afternoon. I'm sure you get this, Mr. Punt, when you go down to pre-prep. And uh, we'll say, good morning, everybody. And they will all say... Good morning, Mr. Mitchell back. So let's try it. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> off piece, and that wasn't how I was supposed to start, but it's relaxed me a little bit. Um, I was also going to say that I do feel incredibly nervous, which is bizarre because I, I enjoy public speaking, but when being asked to talk about history of a school where you've only been uh, working for five years, it's uh, been quite a challenge. But anyway, can I take this opportunity to welcome you to the history lecture on Winterfold House School? The idea was first mooted at, uh, by a group of staff who've been involved in putting this wonderful centenary week together. I'm sure a lot of you who have been to the other events have thoroughly enjoyed those too. We felt that understanding a little more about the school and the community that we love and treasure so much would be a great benefit, giving a greater understanding of the rich tapestry of history that sits behind us. It's been a real pleasure finding out about the history of Winterfold. And if you do get the opportunity, please do take a look at the wonderful archive exhibition that's been put together by Nikki Thorpe, our wonderful archivist. Um, and that is over in the main house. And hopefully, if we get the opportunity afterwards, please do join us over there as well. So let's begin. I want to talk about this lovely, successful, traditional preparatory school that has this year existed for 100 years. The school continues to flourish, which in itself is something of a rarity, particularly as an independent Catholic school, and one that has only recently been directly linked to a major independent school. In its lifetime, the school has survived a huge amount of change throughout a period of casual cultivation and several transplants, which says much for the skill with which its roots were first planted, as well as the careful nurture of the school received and continues to receive. It's incredible to think about the number of children that have, atten have attended throughout this history and I'm delighted that many of our current Winterfold family are joined by ex-pupils, ex-gap teachers, ex-teachers, ex-governors, ex-family member, and one that fits into all of those categories have been able to join us this evening. You're almost very welcome. This evening's talk will be led by myself and Mr. Dieppe, our head of history, followed by a few lovely anecdotes of some of our past pupils. Now, as virtually nothing was generally known about the school's origins, questions have been asked over the past few years to see what could have been learned, and the archive exhibition and this lecture are hopefully the result. This has been put together from the photographs collected, the quotes, the recollections, and although inevitably the story is vague and somewhat incomplete, I hope that this evening will allow us to understand with a little bit more accuracy where it all began. So to start at the very, very beginning, this document, aha, it works, wonderful, is a handwritten letter from Reverend Thomas Harwood to the Earl's estate regarding land sale at Winterfold, 1828. In this letter, Reverend Harwood is denying the Earl's estate the opportunity to purchase the site on this property and the earliest communication that we have on the land which we are all currently sat. At this time, I'm going to hand over to Mr Dieppe. Goodness, I didn't realise it would be that quick. <laughs> Thank you, right. Uh, so, Mr. Mitchell, he said to me, Mr. Diep, I want you to do something uh, light-hearted and contextual to sort of set the scene for the, for the 20s. Now, I just need to work out how this works. It's my first time. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so, light-hearted, 1920s. Now, those of you who are historians will know the 1920s were quite a difficult decade. Uh, it started not quite in the 20s, but in the end of the 19th uh, 19 teens, obviously you got the First World War. Terrible effect on the country. Um, around 880,000 young men uh, brutally taken away from their families. Another 107,000 uh, who died through uh, war-related diseases and malnutrition. Um, massive hole in society, going right the way through the 1920s. And then to cap that off, uh, 1918, 1919, Spanish flu, uh, which nobody really knew about until a couple of years ago. Uh, Covid suddenly made us look backwards into previous pandemics. 
Another 250,000 people uh, taken away from us uh, because of the Spanish flu. The 1920s themselves, uh, where we were then, economically, is slipping towards depression. You had uh, the reintroduction of the gold standard in 1925 made uh, the uh, interest rates uh, go up massively and it was really difficult for us to export our goods. Um, attached to that, we became a, 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 gold, a, a coal importer, net importer for the first time. Uh, it made, uh, and also we were struggling to keep up with other countries in terms of our ability to uh, mass produce goods. So although you had this sort of veneer of frippery uh, that goes with the roaring 20s, the underlying side of that was the 20s were austere, to say the least. Of course, we know about that at the moment. Um, so 1926, you had the, the Great General Strike. 1929, uh, in America, the Great Depression started, took us into the 30s. So not much to be lighthearted about. However, there was a shining light in the 20s, a beacon of hope. And that beacon of hope, folks, was Rupert the Bear. <laughs> now, Rupert, uh, he was born from conflict as well. He was born from a battle between the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. They were fighting for readership after the First World War. And Herbert uh, Torley, who was the, uh, the editor of the Daily Express, came up with a brilliant idea of getting his wife, Mary, who was an illustrator, to create this wonderful cartoon strip. And from 8th of November, that was the first time that Rupert appeared in Daily Express, uh, he, uh, he appeared throughout uh, the 20s and in, uh, came at his first annual in 1936. But we've got Rupert here and also his chumps. I uh, don't know if any of you know these. Anyone in this one? I'm going into teacher mode here. Anyone? No. Bill? Bill. Bill the Badger. Excellent. This one. It's a tricky one, this one. It's Algy the Clever Pup. Uh, this one here, it's an easy one. Edward Trunk. And here we've got Podgy Pig, which I'm not sure you get away with these days as well. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't put Pong Ping the Pekingese on there as well, because I think they've probably been edited out of Rupert since then. However, uh, poor old Rupert, he's eight years old uh, at the time in the 1920s, and Mr. and Mrs. Bear have to try and sort out where he's going to go to school. This is the contextual bit. Now, the, in the same way that the rest of the country was, uh, was struggling with austerity, um, the same with the education system. 1918, the Education Act then, it, uh, it's only then actually that uh, compulsory education went from 12 to 14, and that wasn't really embedded until 1921, the Education Act there as well. Uh, up until 1918, if children attended school in the mornings for half of the week, um, sorry, if they attended school for half the week, they, could only, they only had to stay until 12 o'clock so they could go home or, and work with parents, especially in rural areas. So poor old Rupert here, he had to squeeze all of those amazing adventures he had with flying goldfish and uh, hot air balloons and all the other things he did into his afternoon. So in 1921, he's got less time to do all these things because he's only got uh, from 4.30 to the rest of the afternoon to get these things done. Um, at this stage, in the 1920s, there was lots of discussion about secondary education, but that didn't go anywhere because, again, there was no money to fund this. So most children uh, were educated in elementary schools, which went up to 14. And usually, there would be a hub school in an area, especially in urban areas, which would offer uh, additional education beyond 14, beyond 14 to 16. It was very, very difficult to get that. Only about a fifth of children got any education beyond the age of 14 at this stage. Um, so if you were looking to state educate your child, it was very difficult. It, it was a lottery, really, in terms of where you lived, the kind of, um, kind of options you had. But there was another option, obviously, and that option was you could send your child to a private school with the idea of them going on to a public school. And that's where I'll leave my section. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. I wish I could be as off script as you, but I have a lot more facts to remember. You do. <laughs> <laughs> this is an aerial shot of Birmingham, which I found this afternoon uh, from 19, no, 1923, so exactly 100 years ago. What we do know is that somewhere in amongst that is the origins of our school. 
So in 1923, St Joseph's Preparatory School was founded by Mr Walter Scott Hill and a name more familiar to us, Mr Percy Badley. Along with their wives, the school began life at 19 Clarendon Road, Edgbaston, in Birmingham. Mr Scott Hill had served with the King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry during the Great War. The pupils described him as a magnificent figure and a fine schoolmaster. Another pupil described him as being terrifying, but admits when they met him years later they could see no reason as to why. Mr Scott Hill's academic partner was fondly known to some as Captain, and then later Major Baddeley. Each of these founders appear to have been converted, then practising Catholics, particularly Mr Scott Hill, who was known to be an Anglican clergyman at one time. Mr Baddeley, on the other hand, was a talented and witty speaker. He was also a writer, and after a few years became a frequent broadcaster on the BBC. He took groups of boys from the school to the studios in Broad Street to sing in many different productions. He was a composer of light works and wrote the words and music for several of the early school plays. The early members of staff at St Joseph's were Mr Slay, who didn't stay very long, Mr McKay, who remained, who remained with the school until the 1930s, and Miss Edwards, who taught the youngest boys. And when I talked to the Year 4s about this earlier, they couldn't believe that a school would start with just three members of staff. The first four children, well, boys, who attended the school were John Day, Bobby O'Dowd, Louis Hayes and Frank Aitken. All of these boys were day pupils and arrived in advance of the school offering boarding. The first boarders included Raymond Doherty, Bertie Haynes, John Cook, Philip Shorter and Ian Ingram. At this time, the boys' blazers and caps were light blue and bore the motto Nisi Dominus Frustra, which according to Mrs Eddy is a reference to the opening Psalm 127. Before long, the uniform became suits and collars, with high standards being demanded not only in dress, but in all aspects of school life. On the surface, everything appeared to be going very well, but behind the scenes, all was not happy between the two joint headmasters. Mr Scott Hill and Mr Baddeley were different as chalk and cheese. After disagreement, after disagreement, Mr and Mrs Baddeley moved out and onto ventures new. In January 1924, with the support of some local parents, such as the Keogh's and the Crushes, the Baddeleys set up a new school in the front lounge of the Keogh's house. St Peter's School was formed in Hagley Road, Edgbaston. The uniform was rightly different to St Joseph's, being purple, but continuing with a blazer and a cap. There appears to have been a brief move to Fountain Road before in 1924, premises were secured at 9 Sandon Road, a beautiful double-fronted house just off the Hagley Road. During the first years, numbers grew to 20, including some boarders. Mass was attended at the Church of Our Lady of Good Counsel and St Gregory the Great in Bearwood, with the parish priest Father de Capitan, what a wonderful name, acting as the school chaplain. Sport was held at a field near Hagley Road, and I'm just going to click onto this photograph, although this will give us a, a rough idea of what the dress would have been at the time. But this photograph is five years ahead, and again, with a very different outcome. Optimistically and successfully, with such small numbers, a football 11 was formed. And on the 4th of November 1924, this team played its first match against a Stanley House 11. Not much is known about this particular, fi this particular fixture, this momentous fixture, apart from the scoreline where the valiant warriors of St Peter's School lost 17 goals to one. <laughs> In June 1925, Mr Johnson joined the staff and he was to serve the school loyally for the next 10 years, despite being very deaf as a result of his war service. Mr Baddeley continued to build up the school, numbers rose to a mighty 30 and another school move became necessary. After outgrowing yet another property, they moved into number 31 Somerset Road. This house was entitled Penryn. 
The property had belonged to a gentleman called Herbert Chamberlain, and his initials HC could be, cut, could be seen carved into the timbers of the stable block. Before that, this had been rented by nuns from a Cham Chamberlain family trust. In 1925, another move, as they managed to purchase Harbon Hall. Their last retreat at Penryn ended on the 1st of November that year. The boys had been given an extra long half-term holiday in order for the school to be ready. Harborn Hall stood on about 10 acres of ground and provided excellent facilities for prep school. It was also a particularly interesting area for Catholics because the road opposite had once been known as Mass House Lane. The old Mass House was a farm that had been providing shelter for priests and a place where Mass could be read during times of persecution. <clears throat> it still stands today on the east of the road not far from the junction. Under the tutelage of Mr Scott Hill, the original school, St Joseph's, was growing in both numbers and reputation. By 1927, it had about 25 boarders and 60 day pupils, and was known at the time to be academically excellent. The first scholarship to Beaumont was won by John Day, who I mentioned earlier, a feat which earned the school an extra holiday. Many scholarships were to follow, to establish, uh, to <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Whatever. Many scholarships were followed to schools such as Ampleforth, Cotton Mount, St Mary's, Ratcliffe, the Royal Navy College in Dartmouth and Stonyhurst. Such results allowed Mr Scott Hill to pick and choose amongst the best pupils, whereas entry to St Peter's appeared to be an awful lot easier. In fact, locally at this point, it was not uncommon to find a boy expelled from St Joseph's to turn at St Peter's the very next day something that Mr Badley enjoyed very, very much. <clears throat> St Joseph's was in the Oratory Parish, where the motto was, little birds that can sing and won't sing must be made to sing. Pupils at both of these schools were very musical. Unfortunately, the ongoing feud between the two formidable headmasters meant that pupils of the two schools were forbidden to talk to each other. If they were ever caught fraternising with the enemy, there would be serious, serious consequences. This situation would often cause problems for some families, especially during the school holidays. Both of the founding headmasters continued to argue and bicker over the smallest things, enjoying any opportunity to get one over the other. Sadly, this appears to have been their main focus. And behind the scenes, at both schools, all was not well. Harbon Hall, now known as Penryn House, however suitable, was proving very expensive. Mr Badley had not done his sums, and his ongoing battle was given more of a priority than his spreadsheets. Mr Badley turned to the Oratory Fathers for help. They had been very unhappy about the inter-school feud that had been going on for over four years, and re they revelled in the opportunity to act as peacemakers between the two duelling men. At this time, Mr Scott Hill, with his thriving cohort and continued focus on academic excellence, was ready to retire. After very delicate negotiations, in April 1928, St Joseph's and St Peter's amalgamated at the Harborn Hall site. This was a triumph of diplomacy for the Oratory Fathers and put an end to the state of affairs. The peacemaking was widely welcomed by the community and together the new establishment had a new name. Penryn Preparatory School. On close inspection of some of the early photographs, it became apparent that Mr Badderley never quite got over his, his grudge. As soon as Mr Scott Hill had retired, you will notice in the corner, he renamed the school St Peter's at Penryn. The pair continued to work together until the summer of 1928, before Mr Scott Hill retired. The boys of St Joseph's and St Peter's settled in well together, and the new number on roll increased to 84, which was slightly less than some may have expected. Just as in today's climate, some of the parents did not appreciate the amalgamation and sought different educational journey for their little darlings. Although not much can be found out about it, I'm sure we can all appreciate the look on Mr Scott Hill's face the day in assembly when he met up 
with the child that he had previously expelled from St. Joseph's. <laughs> Following the retirement of Mr. Scott Hill, Mr. Baddeley finally had his claws into St. Peter's at Penryn. Unsurprisingly, he did not like the St. Joseph's uniform, the Eton collars, the suits, and he quickly got rid of them. Although the uniform with a black tie was often retained as part of Sunday best for many years to come. On Ascension Day in 1928, the first mass for the amalgamated schools was read by Father Askew in the new upstairs chapel. The downstairs chapel had recently been converted into a dining hall for the now larger group of pupils. RE, religious education, was being taught throughout the school, creating a clear pathway for confession, first communion and confirmation. This new school was divided into four houses. St Peter's, which was purple, was the house for the boarders. The day pupils were then divided into the following three houses according to the areas in which they lived. St Joseph's were green, St Philip's were yellow and St Paul's were red. This was not the situation for very long, as it's believed to have caused too much rivalry between the boys, having been split up based on, in theory, their postcode. Therefore, this was, this was changed, and all of the boys were split evenly amongst the four houses. The much-feared St Paul's Red Boys from Moseley were no more. During Penryn School's first full academic year, numbers remained steady, but this year was, asked, was marred by illness. Everything happened at once. Measles, conjunctivitis, chicken pox, mumps and whooping cough. Some of the pupils were unlucky to get many of these illnesses back to back to back. There is a story of one boy spending three consecutive weeks in the school infirmary with mumps, followed by two weeks with German measles. During the forthcoming years, there were many new staff to join the team. There was Mr Harrison, who had, who had an infamous limp. As he hobbled around the grounds, he claimed it was a war wound, but chronologically, he was far too young to have served before 1918. <laughs> then there was Mr Fox, who was a rather shy man who taught French, and Miss Needham, who taught the youngest boys. She was widely renowned for not being able to remember their names. Mr Lawson, a pleasant master who taught cricket properly. And finally, Mr Robinson, who was a part-time music teacher who enjoyed taking the whole school singing practice on Friday afternoons. Following the singing practice, Friday evenings became a far less pleasant experience for the children. What became known as Senna Pod Night, a vile tasting dose was administered to each and every boarder. The children who were older and far more experienced at taking such medicine were known to keep the chewy liquid in their mouths until the teachers didn't notice and it would be quickly transferred into their handkerchiefs. The school food was also very different to today, and definitely not as plentiful as the growing boys would have liked. Supper was only a, plent was only a meagre cup of cocoa and two small ginger biscuits. These boys were very clever though. Many of them would save up their small amount of pocket money each week, and the duty boy was run would run as fast as possible to the local fish and chip shop, the Green Man in Harborne. On arrival, he would purchase a huge variety of portions according to individual tastes for salt and vinegar. The duty boy, who was timed by the masters to do his, cho to do his chores, would run as fast as his legs would carry him up to the second floor to deposit the chips in the dormitory cupboard. This would, of course, minimise the aroma. Day to day and after dinner, a trolley would be wheeled out of the dining room in order to be cleared away. These clever, cunning and still very hungry young men would hide in the shadows and snatch the remaining mashed potatoes, sausages, or whatever the evening meal was. The food would then be thrown in different directions to elude the eyes of the oncoming staff. The boys would then scamper off to a predetermined place to consume the spoils. By September 1932, sport had improved dramatically at Penryn School. The two football teams had lost only one match between them, and both the first and the second cricketers had won all of their matches. All of these sporting results were commendable, but academic standards could have been higher. Mr Baddeley seemed not to be able to manage the school in the way that was required. This was very different to the way that Mrs Baddeley was seen. She stood for no nonsense. 
She was over eager as a disciplinarian and was always sneaking around to see what misdemeanors she could discover and then report back to her husband. The boys gave her, gave her a nickname. This, name was, this nickname was La Arana, meaning the spider. <laughs> because it was widely known that Mrs. Baddeley ruled the roost, Mr. Baddeley was known to have tantrums. The slightest offence could lead to a caning, of which he was known to, take, to carry two canes around under his arm. He enjoyed walking around correcting the boys' prep. The marking policy was very different back then. Prep was not marked out of ten, or given an A to E grade, but, bar but marked by the number of strokes of the cane to be awarded. Some of the recollections of former pupils differ, stating that Mr Baddeley was not a disciplinarian at all, and was actually rather pleasant. One thing that was true was that there were some areas of school life that definitely required improvement. One such incident involves boys heading off on their bicycles to a place near the Green Man chip shop, but this time they returned to the school with betting slips in their hand. <laughs> During 1934, with his health declining, Mr Baddeley decided to retire, and this is where real change began at the school. At the suggestion of the Oratory Fathers, his place was taken by Mr Hugh Arbuthnot. He took over at the school at the beginning of summer term 1934. And at the time, there were said to be 40 day boys and 30 boarders. The arrival of Mr Arbuthnot proved to be a turning point in Penryn School's future. He not only saved the school from extinction, but made up for lost ground, particularly on the academic side. The school grew gradually, and it became well known as one of the best and most up-and-coming Catholic schools in the area. Mr Arbuthnot was not a fan of the house system and the rivalry that it had caused. So, short, so shortly after his arrival, he completely rebranded the four divisions of the school with the house system being abolished. This was replaced by four packs. Kites were yellow, hawks were green, swifts red and eagles were blue. This did not just feature on the sports field, but linked in with all aspects of school life. These packs were reported on in every piece of correspondence that went home, with balls displayed in the pupils' common room with the packs in rank order for everybody to see. Reports went home to parents every two weeks. These were called fortnightlies. Each boy began a two-week period with a bonus of 30 marks, which could and did considerably alter between each reporting cycle. Pluses and minuses were also awarded. These were awarded for industry, tidiness, manners, punctuality and games. Records were kept by the staff and up to two marks either way could be given for each of these categories. For example, one piece of work could receive up to two pluses for industry and up to one plus if the same piece of work was presented well. This also worked for minuses. The reports had a space for comments by the form master or mistress, or mistress and also the headmaster. This was an opportunity to provide honest, and praise particularly high plus totals where badges would be awarded in their pack colours and could be worn by the pupil for the two week period until the next report was given. At the end of each term the winning pack was, was rewarded some kind of treat such as an afternoon on the Licky Hills. Apart from the board giving the pack order the billiards room also had on display a copy of the school rules. The most memorable phrase being, any breach of common sense is a breach of the school rules. <laughs> I checked the planners today, and Mr Cottry will be pleased to know, Emily found it. It is still there at the bottom of today's school rules. <laughs> One member of staff who always had a real impact on the borders was the school matron. In 1934, the formidable Miss Wynne Stanley arrived to fill this position. She enjoyed Mr Arbuthnot's approach to education and not a single sound could be heard from the moment that lights out was called. Around 1936, there was a change of matron. Phyllis arrived with a cap and an apron and she supervised the younger boys whilst they brushed their teeth. 
She would iron their clothes and their coats and would ensure their suits were folded properly prior to going home to their families for their holidays. Apart from the morning and night prayers in the chapel and attending mass, spirituality was quietly fostered in other ways too. The boys would often go for day retreats to discuss their religion. One discussion about the missions in Africa was conducted by Father Robert Eaton from the Oratory, who went on to teach at the school. Father Robert Eaton was a prep school dream, as he was not only employed to, not only employed to raise the Catholic profile, he could also teach Spanish. After a year in charge, Mr Arbuthnot had changed the uniform. Eaton collars had disappeared, being replaced by traditional school blazers. These were light grey flannel material and had a PS for Penryn School in a maroon shield on the breast pocket. Ties were also maroon, with grey horizontal stripes, and the boys who, choose to, who chose to wear short trousers had long grey socks with three maroon bands. There was definitely a maroon theme, I just do hope that it was the correct pantone. <laughs> In 1937, the paddock, which was out of bounds, housed Pasha, the donkey. Some of the braver boys pushed their luck and went out of bounds and tried to mount the donkey with little success. Maybe we need a donkey in our new forest school area. We could use it for the nativity, Mrs. Thompson. <laughs> One day in 1937, a lady by the name of Miss Janet Marshall was shown around the school by Mr. Arbuthnot. This visit caused rumours to spread quickly throughout the community. And from that day on, Mrs. Marshall, Miss Marshall, was a frequent visitor. She married Mr Arbuthnot two years later. The lady who went on to be known as Mrs A played a very active role in running the school moving forward. Trips were an important part of school life at this time. In 1939 there was a, there was a visit to the Cadbury's factory where the pupils enjoyed a tour and a short film followed by a very welcome sample of chocolate Later that year, it was the Hawks' turn to win the pack prize. They went into Birmingham roller skating, taking the tram down the Bristol Road, sitting on the top deck where they could touch the trees whilst they were moving. Activities at the school included billiards and table tennis, or board games such as Monopoly. The boys loved gymnastics and played a game called Tick Off the Ground. Full use was made of ropes, mats, wall bars, the horse and the springboard. The gym was also used for quieter games. Boys could often be found looking through piles of old copies of newspapers which were kept in one of the lockers. Outside activities were the usual type of games you'd imagine. Football and cricket were popular as well as tree climbing. The boys also had a fondness of newts. The creatures were often found in the damper parts of the rockery area. Building dens around the ground was popular, where the boys would often hide in gangs, firing their aeroplanes filled with newts or frogs at passers-by. Many of the boys were involved in the school's own scout troop. Mr Arbuthnot was very proud of this, as the troop were to be involved in many of the community events, including lining the streets on the route, on the route up to the newly opened Queen Elizabeth Hospital. War was on the horizon in the early summer of 1939, which impacted the school greatly. An Austrian boy, 17 years of age, joined the school, living with one of the local families. Although this young man stood out from the rest of the boys, he had no difficulty with the language and entered fully into Penryn's school life, even playing cricket with some success. The summer term was not only disrupted by the talk of war, but the outbreak of mumps stopped hawks from taking their pack treat. When they were finally able, they went to Stratford-upon-Avon, where they took a boat trip up the river. Before the summer holidays had ended, war had been declared, and Mr Arbuthnot had to look for an alternate location for the school. Mr Diap, over to you. <coughs> well, I think if we get a donkey, we should call it Rupert. Rupert. <laughs> right. Um, OK, so... The dark, foreboding clouds of war are gathering again. Um, between the wars, there was an increasing concern that uh, any further conflict would, would, would involve uh, aerial attack on civilians. Uh, indeed, during the First World War, 
1914 to 1918, something like 1,200 or so men and women mostly uh, were killed from Zeppelin bombings in London and the southeast. So there was a real fear that vulnerable men, uh, women and children in uh, the built up areas, the, the areas where the factories were, were going to be at uh, considerable risk. Um, the Anderson Committee that was uh, busy planning for this throughout the 1938, uh, which gives a lot of credibility to the, the ideas now, modern ideas, that uh, uh, Chamberlain's uh, policy of appeasement was really designed to give us time to prepare. Uh, they went through lots of different ideas for how this evacuation would work. They, they looked at the idea of building camps uh, around the country, but they decided in the end that it was more practical and cheaper to move people out into the, uh, the less vulnerable areas, into the countryside, um, and house people in those houses. Now, uh, it was a, there was about at least a year worth of planning, uh, and we got to eventually this. Now, uh, so the plan was to try and move 1.5 million uh, children and uh, women out of those vulnerable areas in the cities. Uh, about 800 or so thousand of those were children. It was the biggest evacuation in our history uh, from then to now. Didn't all go brilliantly. Now, we've got some lovely children here. They've got their labels. Uh, their labels had three things on them. It was where they'd come from what their name was and where they were going. And they were given strict instructions not to suck those labels in case those very important details disappeared. Now, if you were unlucky, you might end up being uh, sent to a house where the people who, were, who were had to take you in, uh, they were fined if they didn't take you in, didn't treat you particularly well. It might have been uh, maybe a small farm. Uh, it could have been anywhere. And you could have been made to work and you could have been made to feel very, very uncomfortable in that situation. If you were lucky, however, uh, you might have been plonked with all of your siblings in a massive mansion house with a kindly, absent-minded professor uh, with a wardrobe which gave you a window into another dimension. Bit of few and far between. Um, what actually happened with Operation Pied Piper is it was an incredible success in terms of getting the children out, but the problem was the Germans didn't play cricket. They didn't bomb when we thought they were going to bomb. So by about January, February 1940, around 900,000 of those 1.5 million had gone back home. And it was uh, approximately three or four months after that that the bombing started, and the Blitz started in September uh, 1940. There were two subsequent uh, phases of evacuation as well. Uh, there was one where the Blitz started, and there was another one where the V1 and the V2 bombs started falling as well. In the context of Birmingham, of course, and uh, Penryn School, it was a mere eight miles away from the factories of Longbridge, which had been adapted to build spitfires. So you can see why there was an urgency to try and move out of that very vulnerable, uh, heavy industry area of Birmingham to somewhere a lot more pleasant. Oop, on the wrong way. Hang on. Penryn School had been evacuated to Gayton Hall, a large Georgian house near ross on Wye, which was Mrs Arbuthnot's family home. This was no easy feat, but accomplished in time for the new term in September 1939. The property in Edgebaston was to be taken over by the fire service, before later becoming a post office training centre 
before the buildings were eventually pulled down and the private houses were built on the site. During this time and throughout this period, there was little privacy for Admiral and Mrs Marshall, Mrs Arbuthnot's parents, who owned the house. Not just a few evacuees, but a whole school descended on them for seven years. The drawing room became a classroom. Their dining room was crammed with small tables. The gun room was converted into a common room for the boys, where a map of the estate hung proudly on the wall. Even the morning room could not be retained for the Marshall family, as it doubled up as the staff common room, with the added inconvenience of small boys knocking on the door from time to time. The long hallway was the traffic centre for the children, and when the Admiral went to check his treasured biograph, he was likely to find a boy standing in front of a grandfather clock, a mild punishment carried over from the edge bust and sight. Inevitably, numbers dropped as a result of the move, but all the boys were now what we would call normal preparatory school age. Some of the older boys lodged at the manor house in Upton Bishop. On Sunday evening, those boys would often, would often be read to around the fire. The fire was also a real comfort for those whose turn it was to have their weekly bath. Sadly, this move for the older boys only lasted for two terms, as the owner of the property was taken ill and sadly passed away. These boys were then forced to return to Gayton House, which meant there was no room at the inn, and more accommodation had to be found. Mr and Mrs Arbuthnot and their children were already occupying part of the cottage, One of their bedrooms then had to become a dormitory. Sunday evenings now consisted of Mrs Arbuthnot inviting the boys into her living room to listen to music on the wireless. Mrs A also encouraged the boys to cultivate a small garden in front of the cottage. In the circumstances, it was inevitable that life was rather different from that of a pre-war school, especially for the adults and the older boys. A number of chores fell for the latter, for example, filling the water tank uh, before classes began via a hand pump in the kitchen. There was also the shoe cleaning, where three or four boys sat outside the school's entrance by the shoe racks, where all the boys' shoes were lined up and the mammoth task began. For many of the boys, the move to Gayton Hall was their first real experience of country life. Far removed from the Edgebaston and the city surroundings, it's understood that there was lots of discussions around wildlife and nature, and some of the boys even learned how to milk a cow. The grounds of Gayton Hall offered plenty of space for the boys to play or roam in. They could often be seen, well heard, revising their Latin out loud, as grammar had to be perfect before class. Football was played on the field beyond the woodshed at the back of the hall. The top of the meadow had been found sufficiently level for a cricket pitch, so that the important pastime could be indulged in. At first, though, it was not easy to find other schools to play against. During the first summer or two, there was also swimming on the curriculum. The pool was the bend in the River Wye, just outside of Ross, where cows could be seen standing placidly in the water nearby. For those with bicycles, there was also, also rides led by Mr Arbuthnot. For mass on Sundays, the boys would ride their bicycles and took it upon themselves to attend church in ross on wye just over three miles away. Some of the other boys were also ferried by car. Father Hughes, the local priest, welcomed the ready supply of servers during term time. A year after the move to Gayton Hall, a meeting was held in the headmaster's study, a tiny room that had formerly been used for folding linen. It was requested that the scout troop should be revived. The flags had been left behind in Edgebaston, but many of the boys still had their uniforms, even if by now they were a little bit snug. Mr Arbuthnot was very much along the lines of, even though there is a war, school will carry on as normal. The war itself did not affect the lives of most of the boys closely. An early arrival at Gayton Hall was Patrick Snoy, whose father was a colonel in the Belgian army, and recently taken prisoner at the time of Dunkirk. This new arrival spoke English well and soon footed in, fitted in to life at school. 
the other boys helped to maintain his own patriotism by teaching the others in the dormitory the Belgian national anthem, a kindness that would not have gone unnoticed. To the boys who were from the Midlands, where air raids had begun in earnest, reassuring news from home was always welcome. Shockingly, a bomb fell half a mile from Gayton one night. There was a large, solitary oil bomb, which fell just off the lane. The next day, a large crater, parts of it sticky with unburnt oil, was clear for all to see, and some of the boys recovered the oily fragments of the bomb to display back at the hall. For some time afterwards, when out on a walk or a bike ride, tales were often told about the place where the bomb fell to others that had not seen it with their own eyes. At the end of term, there were other signs that, wars, uh, that war was going on not far from Gayton Hall. Children at Gloucester Station saw barrage balloons floating over the docks, and when the local defence volunteers had been formed, there was often sightings of uniformed patrols making the reality of life very, very clear. Despite the inevitable wartime staffing problems, academic standards were maintained and numbers began to increase. By, by the end of the second year at Gayton, five open scholarships had been obtained, and in 1941, the school was elected to membership of the Incorporated Association of Preparatory Schools. An even higher accolade was achieved by 1943, as the school was recognised as efficient by the Board of Education, with a pupil body that now topped 50. Moving ahead, and with the ending of the Second World War in 1945, the school looked to move away from Gayton Hall. It felt that although, although the premises had served the school well, such a move would be necessary to enable them to move forward. Mr Arbuthnot obtained the freehold of Winterfold House near Chaddesley Corbett in Worcestershire, and preparations for the transfer began. This was similar to Gayton Hall, a Georgian house with large grounds and extensive outbuildings, two lodges and a half-timbered cottage. During the war, the property had been occupied by the RAF to train the women's auxiliary air force that can be seen in this picture. There was a delay between gaining the property for school use and being able to move in. But during the summer holidays of 1946, a few former pupils spent a day or two at Winterfold, tidying up the flower beds, therefore making the surroundings presentable so the school could move in for a proposed September start. This was achieved. And in September 1946, Penryn School at Winterfold House opened its doors to 65 boys. And at this time, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who is kindly going to share some of his experiences, which should follow on very nicely from where we are. Andrew, thank you very much. And here he is. It's good to see the headmaster of Bromsgrove here, Michael Hunt. Very welcome. Um, I remember here Arbuthnot on his opening speech one sports day, a letter was sent uh, from a pupil of the school to his mother. I hate the school. The teachers don't like me. The other boys don't like me. The staff don't like me. I'm utterly miserable. Please can I come home and take me away? The mother's reply was, but Denise, you can't, you're the headmaster. <laughs> <laughs> um, when Penryn came from Gayton in Herefordshire to Winterfold in 1946, my three brothers, Bob, Clive and Luke, and myself attended the school through to 1960. In those earlier days, my mother gave private tu tuition to some pupils for special needs. In his retirement, my father became an invigilator for the common entrance exams. Winterfold played a large part of my life growing up with the Abathnot family. I spent very many happy times in the school holidays at Winterfold and with them at their property in St David's, Pembrokeshire. Charles and his brother Hugh Abathnot and myself were forever making trouble with the under-gardener Jack Cox, such as being caught climbing into the walled garden to steal grapes. We were forever jackbaiting. Hugh Abuthnot was a headmaster during my time. 
He had a huge air of authority, commanding much respect to us all. So much so that it was a rare occasion for a pupil to be beaten. When it happened, rumours spread very quickly around the school as if it was an execution. He was a first-class Latin teacher. I recall on one occasion he called a child a perambulating gargoyle. The child complained to his parents. On sports day, the parents confronted Hugh Abuthnot, whose reply was that the expression was a compliment to the child. <laughs> this silenced the parents. Uh, as my cricket prowess, the headmaster described my batting style to that of a butcher. <laughs> there was then the eccentric Willie, who taught French. I had one of the first big barrows, which Willie confiscated, saying they were, they were not allowed. In common entrance, I had a higher marks in French B uh, than, than the French A. Willie rewarded me with a sixpence after getting enough change from a shilling. <laughs> Willie was regularly cycling his bicycle into Kidderminster with a large rosary dangling over the handlebars. On one occasion, going down Stone Hill, the rosary caught into the front wheel, which caused a tumble. Uh, when cricket matches were in play, there was a 12th player, namely Mrs. Arbuthnot, as you all know, Mrs. A. She was sitting in the pavilion. She was praying the rosary. Food was not the best. Mrs. A was craftily frugal. On Thursdays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays we had beetroot with vinegar and I only learnt today that there was a summer camp very often in the summer holidays where uh, deprived children from Birmingham were, 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 were wanted to come but the district council, the Birmingham city council banned it because of the conditions of the school <laughs> uh, at collation bread was readily available however sometimes the bread supply ran out and we were rewarded with lovely fresh bread, which caused long queues for more. Mrs. Arbuthnot very cannily, normally, kept such bread back for two or three days. Life was somewhat spartan, but as Hugh Arbuthnot kept reminding us that it was character building, as such it was. Parents uh, were always there with their child, he often commented that, their child, that the parents would tell my child extremely sensitive. And his remark was, all parents seem to see, say my children are very sensitive. There was an interesting incident during my first term uh, which led a headline in the Kidderminster Times. Trail of candle wax in school led to conviction. A teacher at the time and the influence of alcohol caused theft within the school. Lone Pine, behind you in the distance, uh, was the tree to run for a penance. Another was clock watching in the hall for any time from five or twenty minutes, depending on severity. That same clock still remains here in the hall at Winterfold that was originally in Birmingham. Uh, on an occasion, as my job as a chartered surveyor and estate agent, I went to value a house near Chasley Corbett. In one of the children's bedrooms, I spied a Winterfold school mug. I proudly stated that when I was an old boy. The father response was, it's such a wonderful school that I'd like to be there and spend my whole life living there. I had the most happiest times of my school at Winterfold. I've heard this so many times from old boys. This is such a compliment for the school. The teaching was a very high standard that when pupils went on to their public school, they spent a year going through all the same stuff again, already taught. Simon Abathnot. Simon was a dear friend whom I missed very much. He was my best man, conducting the ushers from the notes on a blackboard with a billiard cube in my club in Brooks's in London before sending all the ushers on to the Farm Street, Farm Street Church. With Simon, 
was his brother Charles. His brother Charles was an usher. Charles of Uthnock was my exact contemporary at Winterfold. Whilst many prep schools were suffering with numbers and lesser boarders, Simon had the acumen well before other prep schools to cease being a boarding school and to become a day school, taking in girls and starting with a nursery school from the age of three, thus building the numbers from about 110 pupils to 350 pupils. This thus makes the success for the school that it is today. Above all, the Catholic tradition continues to this day being a school founded on Christianity. Ofsted inspectors r nearly always see and expect that higher standard. It's a great compliment to Bromsgrove School to allow the Catholic and, and Catholic tradition to continue. Bromsgrove School had the foresight to see that taking over Winterfold would very much complement their own school. For those who might have attended a school mass, my two brothers and myself presented the gospel book of readings in memory of our brother Clive, who died very tragically when very young, half qualifying as a solicitor. There are many other anecdotal stories that time does not allow. Thanks must go to your head, Mrs. Denise Toms, and to all who teach and manage to the continuous success, which includes the school governors, all playing an active part. You all make it happen. <coughs> Winterfold is such a happy school, and that is why we are all here today. May it continue to flourish for further 100 years and more under the good leadership of Bromsgrove School. All is well. Thank you. Um, well, wonderful stories. Thank you very, very much. And at this time, I'm going to ask John to come and say a few words too. Here you are, John. This is you on the screen, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I only sent him that at lunchtime. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't find one of me um, as a boy here, unfortunately. Um, I haven't brought my wife Celia with me today because she would heckle and say, John, you're muttering. <laughs> so if I do mutter <laughs> and you can't hear me, please do put your hand up or whatever. Um, my connections with Winterfold, formerly Penryn, uh, include firstly the Abuthnot family, uh, of which I'm a member. I have, actually have the name in my, in, amongst my names. Hence, I'm wearing the Abuthnot tartan tie. By the way, Andrew, I'm very impressed you've got the old oh boy I couldn't find that she has <laughs> obviously thrown it out <laughs> and I'm even more impressed that uh, Mark Brennan Myers got his actual school tie I think now in his pocket <laughs> um, uh, secondly my five years here as a schoolboy between 55 and 60 my one term here in the summer of 1967 as what I believe is now known as a gappy teacher um, about 10 years after that, as Secretary of POBA, the Penryn Old Boys Association. 50 years ago, I was also Secretary of the Half Centenary Winterfold Appeal Development Appeal Trust. Uh, from 1975 to 1997, I was the school solicitor for my sins, um, and that was curtailed of necessity uh, when I became a governor, because I might have been in conflict. Um, and the final thing was that from 1997 to 2010, I was first preparing to be and then becoming a founder governor at the invitation of my first cousin, Simon the Abuthnot. So the Abuthnots, well, there were 12 children in my grandparents' family. My mother was number nine and Hugh was number 10. And the two after that were both priests. I was introduced to Hugh and to Winterfold in 1954, having been, I put it, dumped at Gayton Hall, where the school was evacuated, as you've heard, during the Second World War. 
My parents were on going on a holiday, and my godmother, who was Zelie uh, Marshall, um, Jane Abuthnot's stepmother, uh, took me in for three weeks. Um, I was due here a year later, and she brought me to see my cousins. My principal recollection of that um, visit was Aunt Jane driving us all to Harvington in the school dormobile and Charlie about not falling out of the back doors on the way. <laughs> Health and safety hadn't been invented in the 50s, luckily. Before I go on to my school days, I should amplify my reference to Gayton. But before that, a word about Penryn prior to the Second World War. You've already heard a lot, but what I can tell you is that my knowledge is limited, but it was enhanced uh, last week when I received a 16-page account of Dr Dick Bruce's time at Penryn during its first decade in Edgbaston, i.e. between 1928 and 1932. In his document, and I do have it with me if anybody wants to look at it, and I'm also very happy to email a copy to anybody who wants to read it in depth, uh, he, he wrote, Education. I thought that this was excellent. Mr. Baddeley and the Masters not only made you work, suitably reinforced by corporal punishment, but they taught you how to work. That is the important thing and I always felt my school career was started on the right lines and Penryn helped me through the academics that were still to come. Reverting to Gayton, I've been told that HFA, as I knew him, persuaded his father-in-law, Admiral Marshall, to allow the school to move there, as otherwise it was likely to be requisitioned for refugees or for the military. So my two brothers were at school there after my mother took all four of her pre-war children to Gayton after a bomb fell near the family home in Wimbledon. My brother David, who was 90 a couple of weeks ago, remembers starting in the school aged only six as a boarder and being chastised, no doubt deservedly, early in the first term. There were 60 boys there at the time, so he tells me, and so many lived in the farm buildings, you've heard part of this already, as there were only three dormitories, I gather, in the main house. And that these only with one loo for all the boys. Although, David says, in an emergency, they were permitted to use the Admiral's otherwise private one. When my brother Tim uh, moved um, with a scholarship to Beaumont, David was transferred to St John's Beaumont, the prep school, a purpose-built school which contrasted favourably with what he'd endured for the three previous five years. And I suspect the beak was pleased to see the back of him. <laughs> I remember my first journey to Winterfold as a schoolboy. I was seen off at Paddington Station not only by my parents, but also my two paternal aunts, one of whom gave me a large tin of homemade fudge. This became a tradition, and I was always the most popular boy on the school train. On arrival from Kidderminster Station, my uncle took me to the dark and dingy cellars to show me where to hang my boots. There, he unceremoniously abandoned me shattering any concept of my being treated favourably. In that moment, Uncle Hugh became the beak. The only exception was on the 17th of January for the next five years. My mother always sent me back with a birthday present of a cigar for him, and I succeeded in making it a condition that he would light it in our dormitory because I loved the smell. Until it was stale. Other than that, uh, favouritism didn't exist until after I'd left Penryn when he became HFA, but not to his face. Actually, he had a brother who was known as Uncle Baba, and one of my brother-in-laws once referred to him to his face as Uncle, as Uncle Baba. He was the black sheep of the family. <laughs> 
Uh, my uncle is reputed to have thrown his son Simon, his successor, out of the dining room window when he misbehaved during the holidays. So now for some more anecdotes, but please don't be shocked. All my memories of Winterfold are, at least in retrospect, happy. In my first term, I nearly followed my brother David into early trouble when I held the point of my compass closer to the posterior of Mr. Guiton than discretion should have dictated. <laughs> he was looking over the French work of the boy at the desk in front of mine. I should have realised that he would shortly stand up <laughs> with the inevitable result of contact. <laughs> Well, you've already heard about watching the clock. Uh, it was perhaps a punishment unique to Winterfold. I don't know if I've ever heard of it anywhere else. But it was boring in the extreme and humiliating, as it took place in the front hall, so everyone passing by knew one had transgressed. The beak generally tried to avoid confrontation, as one was not allowed to talk in the dormitories after lights out, on his inspections, he would loudly chip his shoes on the stone stairs, much noisier on stone than on wood, as he approached the dormitories, forewarning one that it was time to shut up. However, there was one occasion when I was standing on my bed behind the dormitory door, in West, I think, waiting to jump on the pretty matron as she came in. But I was so embroiled in my planned infringement that I remained unaware that the beak was a few steps behind her. <laughs> I was caught fragrante. Another occasion I remember was in Lodge One dormitory where Jumbo Staines was in charge. He taught my father at St Edmund's Ware during the First World War. And my father was astonished to find him here <laughs> when he came. When I asked him what he had been like, he responded, unteachable like you. <laughs> and my father greatly resented that because he was a mathematician. One night, we were having a tremendous pillow fight in the lodge, and I struck what I thought was a boy coming up the stairs. But it turned out to be Jumbo Staines himself, <laughs> who fell backwards down the stairs. <laughs> How I got away with that, I will never know. <laughs> He retired soon afterwards, and Thomas Williams, who Andrew's already referred to, took over. He was indeed eccentric, but kindly. I've recently found the letter that he wrote me when I passed my exams, uh, and I still have at home two silver spoons he generously gave us as a wedding present. Rather better than your 6p, Andrew, I think. <laughs> Eccentricity in the staff in those days was part of Winterfold's charm. There was Commando Boduano, as I think as deputy head, who was the exception, not eccentric at all, but delightful. Had two boys here as well. And he was succeeded by John Gibbons, who, like Willie, as we called him, was a train fanatic. They had rival railways in Wales. Jeff Hayes with his motorbikes, Mr Oldenall with his Allard car, very rare, and known as Odd Socks because he never wore a matched pair, <laughs> and Tony Harvey teaching French with a temper that used to disturb the beak in the next door classroom. <laughs> there was a definite advantage in being a train boy as I was as the day boys were collected in the afternoon and the tra train boys had an extra night at the school when the rules were greatly relaxed. We were even allowed that night to have catapult fights in the dormitories without retribution. In my time at Winterfold, there were a number of families with a similar number of sons to my uncle and aunt. Notably, these included the McDermott's and the Reeve Tuckers. For me, the family that really stood out was that fathered by O.B., oh boy, Dick Bruce, to whom I've alluded. He had three sons with his first wife, and after her early death, he had three more with her, with 
her sister, one of her sisters. He once told me that his fee-paying time at Winterfold and Bowman spanned 30 years. <laughs> Robert Bruce uh, was the eldest of those six uh, Bruce boys. What a wonderful name to have, Robert Bruce. He told me last week that the groundsman, Ted Cox, who taught carpentry, was once so fed up with him that he put him in a sack and dropped him into the pond. <laughs> I gather he didn't go as far as to tie it up. For Robert, it was all good training for joining the Royal Marines and getting an OBE, for masterminding the Falklands War from Admiralty Arch, while billeted in Epsom with us, Robert being our brother-in-law, as the husband of my wife's eldest sister. In my wandering around last uh, Sunday, uh, I came across a plaque on a building which said, this building was opened by Admiral Sir Richard Thomas, KCB, KCVO, OBE, Black Rod. Old boy, 1940 to 1946, opened on the 24th of May, 1996. Exactly 27 years ago today. I was previously unaware of this famous old boy in Parliament. Other celebrated old boys have included Lord Chitness, Hugh Bidwell, a former Lord Mayor of London, Simon Abuthnot and Andrew Grant as High Sheriffs and Deputy Lieutenants of Herefordshire and Worcestershire, and now many other old boys and girls of distinction as Mr. Price referred to on Sunday. We've already heard about the, the uh, final school rule. What we weren't told was that a breach of common sense is a breach of school rules was chanted by the whole assembly at the end of it. <laughs> and really it was very clever because it caught anything that the beak didn't like. <laughs> I often quoted it to my children, <laughs> to no effect. <laughs> um, anyway, amongst the things that the beak didn't like was swearing or cursing. Even damn was uh, unacceptable. One was supposed to say tut, tut, and nothing else. He also couldn't abide the word nice. He smoked a pipe but often put in his jacket pocket, starting a pocket fire. <laughs> Mrs. A had a way of putting one down when she said, don't be so absurd. Her playing the organ at Harvington was far superior to her cooking. <laughs> <laughs> She's a wonderful organist. <laughs> Senior boys had jobs for which they were paid. Mine was entitled lavatory merchant, <laughs> which involved insur ins ensuring there were adequate loo rolls and no malfunction. When I went to the beak for my pay at the end of term, I was told there would be none, as someone had drilled a hole in all three cubicle walls, enabling boys to look from one cubicle to another. <laughs> How I was meant to prevent that happening was never explained to me, and Addison got away with it scot-free. I did win a gardening cup, the third one, which was no better than a tin. To this day, my contemporaries Bangham and Cope, great friends, continue to deny my win. I must mention Evans N., who adopted a wild cat in our last year, calling it Tenzing. It was fed surreptitiously out of the dining room window in the summer, whereas in the winter, inedible food was put either in the piano or between the radiator fins. Evan N, Evans N took Tenzing home at the end of the final term. Evans N had a reputation for running away. On the last occasion, he announced his decision to do so. So the whole school lined up outside the front door and allowing him a head start, then ran after him, catching up with him before he reached the Lone Pine. 
I'm pleased that tree is still there. As I said when I uh, retired as a governor in 2010, I had many departures from Winterfold. The first I remember was with my father being summoned to collect me because I was sick. He was therefore surprised at the size of my appetite when we stopped for lunch at the smartest hotel in Stratford. Mind you, he had once been summoned to permanently remove my young sister from Ascot's finishing school as she was held to be responsible for a large number of young men from Sandhurst being in the grounds. <laughs> my elder sister was then a novice nun at St Mary's next door. So he said, fine, but if I take one, I take both. This settled it as he left with neither. I digress. I missed a whole term when I broke my leg while skiing. My final schoolboy departure from Winterfold, age 13, was heralded by the headmaster of the Beak, saying at a speech day that 16 out of 17 rather leaky vessels in 5A had reached port. <laughs> David Lacey was another of those <laughs> leaky vessels. Um, my next departure was as a gappy in July 1967. I thoroughly enjoyed that term. I was only let loose on the boys towards the bottom of each class, which meant that if I got stuck, I could usually get the right answer from the boys at the top of the same class. <laughs> sure that doesn't happen these days. <laughs> Simon Abathnot was then teaching at the school, and the coach house had recently been built for the family to inhabit. Previously, when they were at Downside and Ascot, there was no room for them if Winterfold hadn't broken up and they were put up in the attic, reached only by a ladder outside the sick room. Simon commissioned me to build a stone wall in the Colt House garden, which is still there. The wall, that is. For which I had to collect sandstone slabs on my Lambretta scooter from all around the grounds. My departure this time was difficult as the Lambretta had hardly survived that treatment. HFA had come into the staff room and asked the masters in turn, Mr X, have you a moment? All the staff knew that was the moment for them to collect their pay. Always paid a term in arrears. I forget what my first wage pack was, but at least that time it was paid. <laughs> By then I was regularly spending holidays with HFA and his youngest brother Edmund and a varying number of HFA's sons in Ireland and Scotland fishing and playing golf. My role first as secretary of the old boys became like a, 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 a sorry, old boys and later as secretary of the appeal trust meant that I was a very regular visitor at Winterfold and it became like a second home. In those days there was an annual old boys dinner, originally in Edgbaston and latterly at the Stonehouse Manor Hotel. And even once each in the Winterfold dining room and the medieval hall of Harvington Hall. Sometimes there was a drinks party in London and always an old boys cricket match here. I did organise a year dinner at Brockencote in 2010 before a similar event at Beaumont two days later. That being 50 years from when we'd um, left here and gone to Beaumont. Both were attended by four of the six Penrinians who moved to Beaumont in 60 and uh, apart from me, the other three of those were, came all the way from Indianapolis, Ireland and Scotland. We were joined by Father David Lacey, happily with us today, and at least three others, as well as two headmasters and their wives. The Winterfold Appeal Trust was led by D Dr Dick Bruce, already mentioned, his son Michael, Terence O'Brien, a contemporary of mine, and myself and supported by more than 20 others who took on visiting old boys and parents in their parts of the country to seek their contributions. If memory serves me right, we raised £10,000, which 50 years ago was hugely more than it is now. We later raised more 
and the appeal therefore helped to fund both the new gym, known as Penyon Hall, and the new swimming pool. The former has just been demolished <laughs> and will soon be replaced by a superb new theatre. And the latter is the only place I found on my tour on Sunday which failed to impress me. <laughs> By 1976, Simon had taken over from his father as headmaster, and as, as his family grew and boarding diminished, he and Susie moved into the main house and took over some of the former dormitories. Simon, like his elder brother, James, at Stonehouse Cottage, was an amateur builder. I've noticed one or two of his buildings have been demolished. <laughs> two. Of, ne of necessity, he moved the school from boarding to day, and from boys to co-ed. He also sold off some of the lodges and invested the proceeds in building the pre-pep and extending the coat house to become the nursery. There is no doubt that these brave decisions were key to the survival of the school through a major recession. Simon's decision later to transfer the school into a charitable trust saw a transformation. It was a privilege to be invited to be a founder governor in a way, one of the highlights was selecting the new headmaster. I remember that there were 29 applicants, of whom I actually knew six. We first shortlisted six of these 29, and later three were selected for the final interviews. My colleagues accepted my suggestion, given the importance of the wife as part of the team, that I should visit each in their home environment. It was a fascinating process, and I well remember the first to speak after the interviews here, saying, it is his overriding enthusiasm that says it all for me. And so it was that former Winterfell Gappy, Bill Ibbotson Price, became the next headmaster. Clearly, I missed a trick by going into the law in 1967. <laughs> Bill and Linda's tenure saw further expansion and a phenomenal increase in facilities, with in particular the new classroom block just here and the Performing Arts Centre being added uh, across the uh, lane from it. Although Simon and I had retired as governors, it was a pleasure to return when the latter was opened by Prince Edward. Michael Joseph, David Fletcher and Maureen Chapman I think it's Chapman, that's from memory, yes, good, uh, led the governing body with dedication and wisdom through that period. From what I've seen since then, Mrs. Toms and the current governing body have followed suit, and the decision to join forces with Bromsgrove, while importantly and successfully maintaining its Catholic status and ethos, has ensured that Winterfold will continue from strength to strength during its second century. Before I finish, when I was a, here as a gappy in 1967, I took some cine film now converted to a DVD. One of the levers that year, present here to this evening, is featured in abusing my Austin A35 car, with which I later won the Law College Rally with another Penrinian. Arthur Cope as my navigator. Later, I sold the car to Dick Bruce for his wife, with two empty teacher's bottles wrapped in gorse filling the holes where the jacks had gone through the floor on either side. <laughs> this was for just £50. And later, Dick had the gall to question why the bottles had been empty. <laughs> I often think how much it would now be worth as a classic car. That will do for now. I have got one further thing to say, if I may, later. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. And you can please tell your wife when you get home you didn't mumble one bit. <laughs> <laughs> very, very clear. Thank you so much. And last but not least, I'm going to hand over to Phil. And this one's for you, Phil. Thank you. My absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you for that, and well done to those two 
and uh, I can say that it's certainly going to be a step down by speech compared to how good those were. Um, for me to stand here and tell you what Winterfold was like in the late 80s and 90s, I don't think is right, as every child's experience of Winterfold is their own and very different. So I thought I'd recollect a memory or two of mine from when I come back here since having my son Ted. Six years ago, if somebody had asked me to recollect stories of my time at Winterfold, I would have said, I can't remember much, and maybe the odd story of the, on the playing field would have come to mind. However, when attending an open day, whilst looking around for a school for my son, it became apparent, quite apparent the impact and memories Winterfold had on me. I'll never forget the end of the tour, waiting outside the now headmistress's office, just like 30 years prior, yet this time it was not Mr Arbuthnot's voice calling me, calling me in to collect your, my report or discuss my latest misdemeanour. I've still not met an old boy who remembers his jacket pre the addition of the elbow pads. The first parents evening in Ted's current class. We went up the old stairs to Mrs Bayliss's art room, almost at the expectation to hear the air rifle shots going over your head. I believe the risk assessment then was called common sense. <laughs> the other day I had to ask at the reception as to where the visitors toilets were to find myself entering my very first classroom with Mr Chapel as my teacher, remembering moving the desks all around the room as in those days you sat in the order of your latest quarterly report. There were some destined to never leave the side of the teacher. <laughs> While Ted has been here I've come to watch several stage performances. The old gym may have now had a new name and was knocked down just last month, but the memories of walking up to the ste same steps as him to perform in Bugsy Malone or Iceman, which was written by the staff, will never leave me. I was quite upset recently hearing that the swimming pool has been um, closed. Despite, even though it hasn't been used for a while, it looked considerably cleaner and less green than I remember. <laughs> I remember many swimming galas standing, looking down into the green, cloudy, cold water, hoping your team was so far behind you wouldn't have to jump in. <laughs> Last week I was driving down the drive watching Mr Mitchell move the signs for a third or fourth time. Many brought a smile, the excitement of the first Apple computers in Mr Philcox's computer room, remembering the Eh, eh, he made if you had a maths question wrong. The bandstand and listening to Mr Arbuthnot on the tuba that was the same size as most of the rest of the members of the band. <laughs> At the weekend, I was lucky enough to walk around the school with other old boys and we discussed penances. These were given as punishments for the slightest of things and seemed to always be the same boarders out sweeping, collecting the rubbish and doing all the jobs around the school as you arrived in the morning with Mr Arbuthnot's theory that busy hands have less chance of causing mayhem. Our conversations of penances led to discussions of lunch. The menu was slightly different to now. The steak and kidney pie, the beef fizz frisbees, the liver and onions. We were not allowed to leave without a clean plate and at the end of each meal a check would be done around the table and in the radiators to make sure no food had been found its way there. If found, the culprit had one chance to own up, or it would be split eight ways around the table for all to enjoy. I, there, and Mr Farr, who was going to be here tonight, you wondered why I didn't leave that burger on my plate last month. <laughs> when I left Winterfold, there were 98 children. The days of boarding were just ending. The pre-prep was just starting to feed into the main school, welcoming the first girls. It, would, it was the, just the start of a change. And I, can I thank those who have kept the school going and changing, allowing me to come back with Ted to remember so many great memories. My six years at Winterfold seem so small relative to what went before and what has come after. However, this week has reminded me so many great, of so many great times, and I hope all the old boys feel the same. And it is a testament to the fact you don't just attend Winterfold, but you join the community. Thank you.
Now, it's a quick change of uh, technology and something that we would like to share with you. This is the DVD from 1967. I'll give you a little commentary where it's necessary. Of course, in those days, these fields were not part of the school. And the drive was in a different location. Coat House was brand new. And Willie's Railway was just there, so keen-eyed people. This was an old boys match. And there's a shot coming up in a moment with both the about not headmasters in it, I think. That's that's another. There's Simon and HFA sitting uh, in a suit. That's my A35. <laughs> The yard looked rather different. That boy was called Barker, I think. Now, what have you got to say for yourself, Brennick Ma? You can see where the, the field ended. Mrs. A going into the kitchen. This was the sand pit at the back of the house. And I focus in a moment there on, in the middle at the back is another Nicholas Abuthnot who was our cousin, not a Winterpole cousin. Can't remember there. Now this is the swimming pool as then was. The first edition, I think. Willie. <laughs> Mrs. is there again. went a long time ago. I think it fell down. Simon of Othnot. Back to the old boys match for some reason. Uh, with HFA umpiring.
Arthur Cope there coming out, one of my greatest friends, even now. And now Sports Day. I wonder how similar it is these days, or not, as the case may be. <laughs> Mr. Bayliss, I think. And this was the gym display, which I think Mr. Odenall was responsible for. And this is Mrs. A's Scottish dance. <laughs> I just wanted to two things. One, I just wanted to mention to you, we've heard a lot about Simon. Um, his funeral was private to the family. There were, I think, about 50 family there. Um, Simon had a great love of trees. And a lot of the trees that you see now up there and all over the place, he planted. On the Friday before he died, he died on the Tuesday of the following week, uh, he went to visit his brother James at Stonehouse Cottage across, um, on the way after Musto Green. 
but he got Susie to drive him down the drive so he could see how the trees had developed. And he was very, very impressed and delighted, so I'm told. I, uh, at the funeral, uh, he was buried in the churchyard, and we all went out to the, to the place where he was to be placed in the grave. And as, um, as the coffin was being lowered into the grave, there was a sudden, like, it was like a mini tornado, and all the trees went like this. It was absolutely magical, incredible. So I just wanted to share that with you because it was a, it was a lovely moment. Unfortunately, I was in the States with Arthur Cope when uh, the memorial service took place in Hereford, so I wasn't at that. But the funeral itself was lovely, and there were trees actually in the in the church lining the aisle, which the family then took home and planted in their own gardens. Uh, I can't end without saying how much I've been impressed both on Sunday and today, by what I've seen. The grounds and buildings are immaculate, and the concert on Sunday was truly superb. I have the firm, firmest impression that for the girls and boys and the staff, both teaching and domestic, this remains a tremendously happy place. Just as it was for me in the 1950s, one alumina wrote... I congratulate Winterfold on lasting a hundred years. It is, it is an extraordinary achievement, and I suspect that many fewer prep schools have lasted that long than have shut their doors. I add my personal congratulations to Mrs. Tons and to everyone in the Winterfold family. A hundred not out. Fantastic. And a tribute to you and all your forebearers who established and nurtured this remarkable school. To close, the Abuthnot and Winterfold's crest are the peacock's head and motto, Laus Deo. Praise be to God. Thank you. Thank you, John, for those closing remarks. Hard to follow that. Um, but it is really lovely to see so many of you here sharing in these wonderful memories. And I think what is so special as well is to know that these wonderful traditions have carried on. Many things throughout the school have lasted. When I came here in 2000, we were still doing fortnightlies. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to say, all the staff will be very pleased, that we're not carrying on with fortnightlies. Um, but that tradition still carried on. Um, again, many things which we do. We still call it collation, our morning break, a lovely tradition. And we still have the pluses and minuses. Of course, we're more emphasising on the side of the pluses, which the children vie for, which is wonderful. And, of course, we have our wonderful pacts. And it was mentioned about those eccentricities which we have at Winterfold. And we've really built on those eccentricities. And you might notice here in front of you, we have these wonderful pack mushrooms. And every Friday when we have our celebration assembly, our pack leaders sit at the front of the assembly hall on their pack mushroom, which is still represented in those colours which we heard about. So we've built on those eccentricities, which is just so wonderful for Winterfold, because what you can see from all these wonderful recollections from that cine film is that it's about building those memories for children. This is a really, really special place. And you can hear from everything that's been said today how dear it is to everybody and the memories they take away with them, which are so special. So I really want to just say a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to Mr Dieppe, who really put everything into context. So thank you very much, Mr Dieppe. And 
of course, to our speakers today, um, to John Flood, past pupil, GAP student, governor, founder governor, who's been ever loyal to Winterfold. So thank you, John. And to Andrew Grant, again, past pupil, uh, who I know has kept Winterfold in mind over these many years. And our school choir has performed at many of your events there. We've been very lucky to do that. So thank you, Andrew. <laughs> and to Phil, Phil Page, past pupil and current parent. And of course, one of the greatest advocates for the school. Thank you, Phil. Now, when we first started discussing events for the centenary, um, Mr. Mitchell here was very enthused by the idea of giving a lecture on the history of the school. And he went away and he researched it and he has put together this wonderful presentation for us today. So thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell, for giving us this overview of Winterfold from 1923 to 2023, which is a fitting tribute for our centenary celebration. Thank you very much. So we have a few little thank yous for our speakers today. We are on a little momento. So, uh, John, if you're not there, just to say thank you very much. Thank you, John. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And to Phil, thank you so much. You already have the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, just if anybody would like to stay, we've got um, lots of things to look at here. There's an exhibition in the front of the house. I know some of you have mentioned about the honours boards having a look at those. Or if you want to tour, Mr Mitchell's very happy to take anybody in at all. So thank you very much, everybody. Have a good evening.